Dear brethren, we have many reasons to praise the Lord. We are still alive Amen. today. And we, see, we should think seriously about that. Because we are alive today because Christ is interceding for us. Amen. He gave his life on Calvary in our behalf. Then, brother, I ask you to pray so the Holy Spirit can be with us. We can understand the word and apply to our individual life, especially. I invite you, brethren, to open your Bibles in Luke chapter 13. Let us read uh, since verse 1 to verse 9. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, he shall all likewise perish. For those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbers in the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And it if bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. <coughs> Brethren, we have here a, a message of mercy and the mercy of judgment in this parable. Christ always represents both mercy and righteousness. Mercy and the judgment. Let's consider the first part of this verse. Some people, they came to Christ to tell him about the tragedy. Some people, they were worshiping, and Pilate killed them. But what was the intention of them to, to tell this about that? Some people, they were killed. The intention was that, uh, Lord, look, those people were terrible sinners. They were killed, but not us. We are here because we are good people. And even the disciples, they were waiting for some word of Christ condemned those who had been killed. But they were very surprised when Christ said, if you do not repent, you, all of you will be killed, you will, be, you will perish. Brethren, what do we think about tsunami? Those people, 200,000 people died. What do we think about them? Uh, are we tempted to compare them with us? We escaped from tragedy because we are better than them? Are we tempted to do that? Christ was addressing this message to the Jewish people because uh, Christ was almost finishing his mission. He had just one year before him. And he knew that uh, as a nation, the Jewish people, they would reject him. 
what will be their fate later, 40 years later, as a nation, they would be destroyed. In the year 70, they were destroyed as a nation. But Christ has a message, an individual <coughs> message also for us, each one of us. Then Christ uh, told them the parable of the fig tree. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit of this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why cumbers it in the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. If not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Brethren, I have some problem in our home. We have two trees there. They don't bear fruit, and they are crooked. I am strongly tempted to cut them down. <laughs> because what usefulness? They are not beautiful trees. And they don't bear fruit. What are they useful? Just shade in the, in the summer. Now they have no, no leaves also. <coughs> Then, brother, when a tree is not, it's just occupying the, the place, the room, and producing nothing, they are not beautiful, they are not <coughs> bearing fruit, what is the destiny of that tree? Fire. Then Christ used this uh, example to explain the situation of Jewish people, but brother, not only them. This message applies to God's people, apply to us as a people, and apply to us as individual. How many years did God bear with the Jewish people? You could say that more than thousand years. More than thousand years. But when Christ presented this parable, he was almost finished his mission of three and a half years. And he, he presented this, this condition. Then this parable prim primarily refers to the nation as a, and the people of the Jews. God chose them for his own, made them a people near to him, gave them advantages for knowing and serving him above any other people, and expect answerable returns of duty and obedience for them, from them, which, turning to his praise and honor, he would have accounted fruit. But they disappointed his expectations. They did not do their duty they were a reproach instead of being a credit to their profession. Brethren, when we are not faithful to the light that we have, we are creating problems. Because who is worst? Because all of us, as believers and the unbelievers, we are sinners. But who are the worst? Because those who do, do not know the gospel, do not know the truth, they commit terrible sin. But they consider themselves wicked, pagans. Then the world cannot expect much from them. But how about God's people? If we, we are not faithful to our call, then we are creating problems because we are representing, uh, in a wrong way, God's character. When I was studying in university, 
I read a book written by a Portuguese writer. And he was telling about his unbelief. Why? You know, uh, Portugal and Spanish, they are Spanish, Spain, Spain. They are Catholic countries. When people, they find, found out that uh, Catholic religion was not the best one, they were disappointed with God. They, become, they became <coughs> atheist. Because they expect something else, something better from the church. They became atheist. Then when we, not, we do not represent well God's character, we scatter instead of gather. That was the serious problem with the Jewish people. Uh, God put them in a special place. God gave them special truths. The gospel was very clear in the mess of the sanctuary. Everything was explained through the sanctuary service. But uh, they, re they reject the Savior. Ac according to this parable, uh, God the Father is the owner. And Christ was the dresser. Christ was interceding in behalf of his people. Even though they spent so many years rejecting God's truth, God gave them more time. And when Christ presented this parable, he was in the second year of his mission. And he said, give them one one more year. Let us wait. I will work for them. I will do my best to save them. If they accept, well. If not, they will be cut down. Christ, in his teaching, linked with the warning of judgment the invitation of mercy. But always when we read the Bible, we find God is inviting us. And the Bible says, while he is near. What's the meaning of this word, while? There is a, there is a limit. If we do not fulfill our mission as God's people, or as individuals, we have a time of probation. If we reject the, God's grace, then ought to be our destiny. When Christ presented this parable, people, the people, people understood very well. Christ's hearers could not misunderstand the application of his words. David had sung of Israel as the vine brought out of Egypt. Isaiah had written, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. The generation to whom the Savior had come were represented by the fig tree in the Lord's vineyard within the circle of his special care and blessing. And everything that should be done was done for them. And Christ uh, presented the question, what could I do that I have not done? When Christ was sent from heaven, heaven sent everything in Christ. And when the people reject Christ, they reject everything. There was no other option for them. God in his son had been seeking fruit and had found none. 
Israel was a cumberer of the ground. Its very existence was a curse, for it filled the place in the vineyard that fruitful tree might fill. It robbed the world of the blessing that God designed to give. But what's the reason why God has a people on earth? What's the reason? Or what are the reasons? What is our mission here in the, this earth? Uh, God's church is represented as an embassy to represent God's government of righteousness and mercy. If we fail to represent God's character, then we lose the reason to exist. God chose a people to save the world, to preach the gospel to all the world, not only with word, but with the life, with life. And uh, we, we know the history, the behavior, the action of Jewish people, they brought reproach upon, upon God. Because the pagan, they were looking to the Jewish nation as God's people. But they were not representing God's character. The Israelites had misrepresented God among the nations. They were not merely useless, but a decided hindrance. To a great degree, their religion was misleading and wrought ruin instead of salvation. <coughs> Brethren, there is no third option. If we don't bring salvation to the world, we bring destruction. We represent, in a wrong way, God's character. In the parable, the dress of the vineyard does not question the sentence that the tree, if it remained fruitless, should be cut down. But he knows and shares the owner's interest in that barren tree. Nothing could give him greater joy than to see its growth and fruitfulness. He responds to the desire of the owner, saying, let it alone this year also, and until I shall dig about and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well. That was the intention of Christ, to save his people. The Bible says he came to, the, to his own, but they didn't know him and accept him. The gardener does not refuse to minister to so unpromising a plant. He stands ready to give it still greater care. He will make it surrounding most favorable and will lavish upon it every attention. Then the last year of Christ's ministry was a special year working hard for the salvation of people, the of Jewish people. But he was utterly rejected. Now, brethren, we have another application here. I think that this is more interesting for us in, as individual. Every one of us here, we are a fig tree. We are occupying the ground. Brethren, I think that you agree with me that uh, God's people today, we have this special light. Every blessing was given to us. Are we following the light that we have? If not, then we are spreading darkness. The warning sounds down along the line to us in this generation. Are you, O oh careless heart, a fruitless tree in the Lord's vineyard? Shall the word of doom ere long be spoken of you? How long have you received his gifts? Uh, I think that we have different answers. First answer, I, I, 
I received this blessing for almost 60 years in my life. Some of you, five years, 10 years, 20 years. All of us, we had, have received God's blessing. How long has he watched and wait for a return of love? How long? Planted in his vineyard, under the watchful care of the gardener, what privileges are yours? How often has the tender gospel message thrilled your heart? You have taken the name of Christ. You are outwardly a member of the church, which is his body. And yet, you are conscious of no living connection with the great heart of love. The tide of his life does not flow through you. The sweet graces of his character, the fruits of the Spirit, are not seen in your life. Let us apply it to us individually. The barren tree receives the rain and the sunshine. In the gardener's care, it draws nourishment from the soil. But its unproductive both only darken the ground. <coughs> so that fruit-bearing plants cannot flourish in its shadow. So God's gifts, lavished on you, convey no blessing to the world. But that's an invitation for us to think about our own condition. Are we reflecting God's light to the world as individual? The sweet grace of his character are not seen in your life. So, you are robbing others of privilege that, but for you, might be theirs. You realize, though it may be but dimly, that you are a cumberer of the ground. Yet, in his great mercy, God has not cut you down. He does not look coldly upon you. He does not turn away with indifference or leave you to destruction. Looking upon you, he cries, as he cried so many centuries ago concerning Israel. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God, I am not man. The pitying Savior is saying concerning you, concern me, concern each one of us, spare it this year also, till I shall dig about it and dress it. How shall we respond to this message, brethren? Are we using properly the light that we have received from the Lord to help others? Interesting that uh, one year later, Christ uh, worked another miracle. Interesting, one year later, at the end of his mission, let us open Matthew 21. 18 to 20. Almost close to his death on the cross. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it. And he found nothing thereon. <coughs> but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Uh, through this miracle, Christ presents another, another parable. 
one year before, one year was given to the tree to produce fruit. One year later, what was the action of Christ? He destroyed the tree. And the, the disciples, they were shocked because they used to hear from, from Christ only promising, only words of love. Because for God, destruction is a strange work. And when Christ cursed that fig tree, they were astonished. How could it be? The entire night Jesus spent in prayer, and in the morning he came again to the temple. On the way he passed the fig orchard. He was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves. Let us note this point. Having leaves. He came. If he happily, he might find some and think thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. Brethren, when we see a fruitful tree, full of leaves, what is our hope? Yeah. We'll find some fruit there. But uh, let us apply it to spiritual life. What, what the meaning of a, a believer full of leaves? He has good appearance. Outwardly, he's a good Christian. But if he has own leaves, what the situation? What kind of life is that? It's a deception. When I was a little boy, we know in Brazil the time of fruit. Then we used to go to the mango tree, mango tree. And when the, in the time of mangoes, the tree was full of leaves and no fruit at all, we were so disappointed. Then we were searching for another tree. It was, it was not the season of ripe figs, except in certain localities. And on the highlands about Jerusalem, it might truly be said, the time of fig was not yet. But in the orchard to which Jesus came, one tree appeared to be in advance of all the others. It was already covered with leaves. It is the nature of the fig tree that before the leaves open, the growing fruit appears. Therefore, this tree is full. In full leaf, gave promise of well-developed fruit, but its appearance was deceptive. Upon certain its branches, from the lowest bud to the topmost twig, Jesus found nothing but leaves. It was a mass of pretentious foliage, nothing more. Brother, let us think about our lives. Do we have fruit in our lives or just leaves? Do we, have the, do we give the impression to the world that we are good believers, according to our appearance? But how about our lives? Do we bear fruits? Christ uttered against it a withering curse. He said the next morning, as the Savior and his disciples were again on their way to the city, the blessed branches and dro drooping leaves attract their attention. Master, said Peter, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. Christ's act of cursing the fig tree had astonished the disciples. It seemed to them unlike his ways and works. Often they had heard him declare that he came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. They remembered his word, the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. His wonderful work had been done to restore, never to destroy. 
The disciple had known him only as the Redeemer, the healer. This act stood alone. What was its purpose? The cursing of the fig tree was a parable. The bearing tree flaunting its pretentious foliage is in the very face of Christ was a symbol of the Jewish nation. The Savior desired to make plain to his disciples the cause and the certainty of Israel's doom. For this purpose, he invested the tree with moral qualities and made it the exposed of divine truth. The Jews stood forth distinct from all other nations, professing allegiance to God. They had been especially favored by him, and they laid claim to righteousness above every other people. But they were corrupted by the love of the world and the greed of gain. Two points here. Love of the world and greed of gain. They boasted of their knowledge, but they were ignorant of the requirement of God and were full of hypocrisy. Like the barren tree, they spread their pretentious branches aloft, luxuriant in appearance and beautiful to the eye. But they yield nothing but leaves. The Jewish religion, which is its magnificent temple, its sacred altars, its mitered priests and impressive ceremonies, was indeed fair in outward appearance. But humility, love, and benevolence were lacking. Now, brethren, let us apply this last lesson for us also. There are very uh, dangerous heresies in the world. Once I was talking with a Catholic priest, and he said to me, look, God's merciful. God will save everyone. He cannot destroy. He is good. It's true that God's good. God's good. But if we reject his mercy, if we, if we don't walk in the light that we have received, what will be our fate? Then, brother, we should understand that uh, in the Bible we find the mercy of God and judgment. God is true. When he promised salvation, he fulfilled his promises as we accept his conditions. When he mentioned about judgment, he will fulfill his judgment. And we can only be free from condemnation if we go to Christ and if you accept him as our savior and if we live according to his will. Brethren, I'd like to call your attention for 1 John 1, 7. That's a very serious text. If, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. Uh, do you see one condition here? Just the beginning of the verse, not the condition. If we walk in the light. It's true that we cannot walk in the light with, without Christ. But if you are willing to walk in the light, he will give us power to walk in the light. In every age there is given to men their day of light and privilege. <coughs> a probationary time in which they may become reconciled to God. But there is a limit to this grace. 
there is a limit to this grace. Mercy may plead for years and be slighted and rejected, but there comes a time when mercy makes her last plea. The heart becomes so hardened that it ceases to respond to the Spirit of God. Then the sweet winning voice entreats the sinner no longer, and the proofs and the warning cease. That day had come to Jerusalem, Jesus wept in anguish all over the doomed city, but he could not deliver her. He had exhausted every resource. In reject the warnings of God's spirit, Israel had, had rejected the only means of help. There was no other power by which they could be delivered. Brethren, for us also, God has given us all kinds of blessings, spiritual blessings, physical blessings, hope of salvation in Jesus Christ. But if we do not take seriously his invitation, what will be the result? Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How we escape? How shall we escape? Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. And verse 21, to him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Bread and Christ is still interceding for us. He's presenting his blood, his sacrifice, his perfect righteousness in the sanctuary for us. But very soon he will say, it is finished. Let us take advantage of this day to have a, a more deep communion with Christ our Savior. That's my wish and prayer. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus our Savior, we come before thee with thanksgiving for all thy mercy, thy love, thy care, thy long suffering with us. Amen. We praise the Lord for Christ, who gave his precious life on Calvary, and now he's interceding for us, presenting his righteousness in our behalf. We ask forgiveness, Lord, for our shortcomings, for our sins. If we not, are not following the light as we should, forgive us and give us grace to reflect your character in our lives. Help us to be faithful believers. Help us to do thy will in our lives. Bless each one of us here. You know, Lord, our individual condition. Amen. You know our needs, our spiritual needs. Take our hearts, forgive us, cleanse us, and give us power to reflect your, right, to reflect your righteousness before the world. Help us to bear fruits according to thy will. Help us, Lord, to be in close communion with thee and in fellowship with each other. Help us in our preparation for the last events and for the coming of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.